We continue this week looking at the nature of God through the lens of the Old Testament. We began looking at God as creator and then the scene where God's name was revealed to Moses. and God said, I am what I am. And then we followed that up with the story of the Exodus, the departure from Egypt. And the story that we look at now this morning really continues right, right from that story of Exodus. We come to Mount Sinai where God reveals to Moses what we call now the Ten Commandments. So let us listen together for God's Word. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, as we hear these familiar words, the words of your law to us, we pray that you would speak through them, that we might hear your voice, we might hear these words in a new way, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. When did you last discuss the Ten Commandments? Or when was the last time that you heard talk about the Ten Commandments. My guess is it was on the news. It was probably some courthouse or other in some state or other. A courthouse puts up a display of the Ten Commandments and then controversy ensues. And it makes the news and that's the discussion. It so often is the center of controversy, in particular when it comes to the question of religious freedom, the question of the separation of church and state. It seems that the Ten Commandments always find their way into the middle of it. Have you heard about the latest one? It's in Oklahoma. The state capitol at Oklahoma, they have erected a a plaque with the Ten Commandments uh, on the the grounds of the state capitol. Well, an atheist group finds that objectionable, and so they have proposed a statue of, uh, I'm not going to remember the name, but a Satanist uh, deity uh, that that has horns. It's kind of a goat-headed thing sitting on a throne. And they've designed it such that children can go and sit on the lap of this this, uh, statue. And and it is supposed to sound absurd. It was intended to be absurd because the point is that if they're going to put up one statue, they should be able to put up any old statue, including one of a Satanist cult. It seems like it's not going to go anywhere, but the point is being made, challenging the the, uh, plaque of the Ten Commandments on the state capitol grounds. Once again, the Ten Commandments at the center of controversy, religious freedom, the separation of church and state. Now, the Ten Commandments are depicted in many courthouses across the country, including the United States Supreme Court. uh, uh, On the front or the the back, I'm not sure if it's the front or the back of the building, the United States Supreme Court, right at the top, is Moses, front and center, with the two tablets containing the Ten Commandments. the large wooden doors leading into the, the courtroom, the, the main courtroom of the Supreme Court, are two tablets carved into the wood with Roman numerals 1 through 10. Now that being said, there are also in the, state, in the United States Supreme Court building and, and likely in many other courthouses across the country, there are other 
uh, symbols and representations of lawgivers throughout ancient history, including Hammurabi and uh, Confucius, and even Muhammad is represented at the United States Supreme Court. And so these depictions, at least in large part, are probably honoring the Ten Commandments as an ancient code of law, as something that we, along with other codes of law, have inherited that has helped to shape who we are as a, a legal society, has helped to shape our system of justice. Now, there's no doubt that Moses and his Ten Commandments take center stage. They receive a kind of a priority, given the fact that the Judeo-Christian tradition has so influenced the formation of our country. But all the same, there are other lawgivers there too. And so the Ten Commandments are depicted, as we usually see them, as an ancient code of law, as something that is respected by even our justice system, but it is just that, an ancient code of law. And is that all the Ten Commandments are? Because if they are, then we can give them that place of honor. We can recognize them as, as influential in, in early society, forming uh, a kind of a justice system, a very crude one, but a justice system nonetheless. We can honor them as that and then, and then dismiss them as a relic, as an ancient piece of the past that we have inherited, but we have gone far beyond that. Our justice system, though far more complex, is also far more compassionate, we might say. But if not, if we can't just cast them aside, if they are something more than a relic of the past, then when we make them the center of controversy, we completely miss what they are all about. We pull them out of their context. And, and all we see is that legal code stirring up controversy, stirring up news stories, but we miss this story. We miss the story of God's law being given to God's people immediately after God had rescued them from slavery. We have to remember that context for this uh, famous passage. We have just completed the Exodus. The Israelites had been in slavery for three or four hundred years in Egypt, brutally oppressed. And finally, they cry out to God, and God hears them, and God answers them, and God delivers them. God sends Moses to Pharaoh, and God delivers the people of Israel. So there they are after three or four hundred years of captivity and forced labor, and they are free. And they, they cross over the Red Sea and they travel through the wilderness, through the desert, for two months until they come to Sinai, the mountain of God. And there, at Sinai, they gather and they wait. Imagine the chaos. This brand new people that has never had any independence before, that has never had any leader aside from Pharaoh and his minions, and here they are all clustered together at the foot of a mountain. Imagine the chaos. And then there's Moses, who is in charge. Moses, who is their leader, the one who has led them out of slavery, it is his task to bring order to the chaos. And Moses is at his wit's end. Moses doesn't know how to do it. Moses doesn't know how to, how to corral this mass of humanity, how to, how to bring some kind of order and sanity to the chaos. But God knows. And so Moses, or rather God, calls Moses up the mountain. And a, and a cloud of smoke and fog descends on the mountain and the people are terrified and they hear the voice of God speaking to Moses. And God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Now Christians have a complicated relationship with the law. It's, it's sort of like, um, like a hangover. Um, we, we feel like, like we can't get rid of the law, and yet we feel like we should move past it. We feel like it should be over and done behind us and, and long ago forgotten. I, when I was in high school, I was a, uh, an intern at an elementary school, a volunteer. And I remember the first day I walked into the elementary school as a junior in high school, and, and, I, and suddenly I was flooded with memories of being in elementary school and all of the structure and of course the rules that go along with being in elementary school, all of the, the, all of the things that children need in order for, for chaos not to break loose. But there I was in high school amid elementary school students and I felt so powerful and superior that I was no longer subject to these rules and structures. And I think that's a little bit of what it's like to be a Christian and look at the law. In fact, Jesus uh, talks about the law a little bit. He says He came not to 
abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But do any of us really understand what that means? It's a little bit confusing. Most New Testament writers use the law as a kind of straw man, as a, as a flimsy target, an easy target to attack, because grace is obviously so much better than law. But, and, and Jesus, who himself said he came to fulfill the law, even, even he violated the Sabbath intentionally to make a point. Even, even he ate with sinners. He consorted with those who made him unclean according to the law. He went to the temple and he overturned the tables. How has Jesus, doing all of these things, come to fulfill the law? And then there's Paul, who writes this in our passage this morning, We were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. As a Christian, it's hard to understand how these two dynamics of grace and law work together. How are we to incorporate the law into our understanding of what it means to be faithful? Because much of what the New Testament tells us is that we are no longer under the law. Instead, we're under grace. But in spite of all of this, in spite of the confusion, in spite of the tension that we try to live in, we still recognize the Ten Commandments as normative in some way. We see these Ten Commandments as authoritative. But even this is fraught with trouble. Even considering the Ten Commandments as basic as they are, as authoritative, is troublesome. There are more than 600 Old Testament laws. The Old Testament doesn't tell us that these laws are more important than any of the others. It sets them apart, gives them a primary place. They are among the first to be revealed, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, Scripture doesn't say that the others are, are to be regarded as slightly less authoritative. And so being that there are more than 600 laws of the Old Testament, it is, nearly, it is impossible to follow them all. And we, have, we as Christians really have discarded the lion's share of those laws, and that is much of what Paul is talking about when he talks about being under grace and no longer under the law. So many of those laws are obscure, things that seem barbaric now, things we would never uh, follow today. If your child is uh, difficult, you have the right to stone him or her. That's one I'm not sure that I've ever heard a story of someone doing. There are many laws like this. Uh, eyebrows in the room just went up, parents with teenagers. Uh, there are many laws like this in the Old Testament. We accept some, and we ignore others. How do we know which ones apply and which ones don't? This is uh, the snag that we run into in contemporary debates about things like homosexuality, capital punishment, things that people might resort to the Old Testament for laws that state very clearly that something is accepted or prohibited. As soon as one law is accepted as authoritative, you find yourself in a bind because there are so many others and how do we pick and choose? It's just as hard to prove one position as another based on the laws of the Old Testament. But now I'm going to step back from this minefield. I won't go any further. These are the snags that almost any Christian discussion of the law will run into. These are the troubles that we have. Knowing what we know of God in Christ, these are the troubles that we have looking back at the law, the whole law, and particularly the Ten Commandments. And here's what I think is the problem. We tend to focus on the laws themselves and not on the one who gives them. We tend to focus on the law instead of the lawgiver. And a focus on the laws themselves leaves God no position except disciplinarian. When our focus is on the laws, God becomes the enforcer. But if we begin with God, if our focus starts with God, then we come, or we can come, to a new understanding of the law. If we begin with our understanding of who God is, of how God is at work in the world, of how God was at work in the people of Israel, we might be able to see the law in a new light. God began something astounding in the Exodus. We talked about this last week. God took a weak and threatened people. A people who had no hope for their future. A people who were oppressed. They were enslaved. And God took this people and rescued them. 
God saved this people, demonstrating not just God's own power for all of the other nations to watch, but God demonstrated compassion for the people of Israel and compassion for anyone who is enslaved, anyone who is oppressed. God is the God of the oppressed. And God made good on God's promise to Abraham. God is faithful to the covenant. That is the beginning of the story. God's faithfulness to the covenant is the beginning of the story for the people of Israel. It is the beginning of the law, and it should for us be the starting point as we try to understand what the law means. What is its significance? That God is faithful to the covenant. That is the starting point. And we see that the the Exodus comes right before our story. Our story is, is really a part of the Exodus, and so we can't separate the two. We can't pull the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. We can't pull this this legal code out of the Exodus because the two are one and the same. They are part of the same story. They are a part of God's work in the people of Israel. They are a part of what God is doing in the world for us. If we look at the Ten Commandments, there there are two rough categories that scholars and theologians have for centuries seen them falling into. And the first are the first four commandments. And they have to do with our relationship with God. And they begin with the recognition that God is the one who brought them out of Egypt. That is the beginning of the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. So the relationship, our relationship with God begins from the recognition that God has rescued us. That God has saved us. God has brought us up out of our bondage, out of our slavery, and set us free. That is the beginning of our relationship with God. It is the beginning of the law. And so the God that we honor in obeying the law, the God who who we receive these laws from, is a God of compassion. A God who liberates the oppressed. A God who cares for the suffering. And so our relationship with God is determined, or rather is defined, by these characteristics of God. God's compassion. God's care and concern. And then there's the second part. The the commandments that deal with our relationship with our neighbor. Thou shalt not steal, not murder, not covet, and so on. God is concerned for the state of the community. God is concerned for the shape that the community will take. Something amazing has happened in the Exodus. God has liberated. God has set free. God has rescued. And God wants that community to continue to be a community where people are set free, where people are liberated, where people are rescued and saved. God wants the community of Israel to be a community of salvation, a community of liberation. God wants the things that have begun in the Exodus to continue forever, never to stop. And so God is trying to give shape to this community, to this chaotic mass that Moses then has the responsibility of ordering. God wants that community. God wants our community today to take on the shape of the Exodus community. To be oriented toward rescue, salvation, liberation. And so anytime that the law is used to oppress... Anytime that the law is used to put people in bondage, it has lost its connection to the Exodus. It has lost its roots. It has come off its hinges. It no longer functions as God's law, and it needs to be reconsidered. And so this is where we meet Jesus. This is where we see the actions of Jesus, where Jesus is questioning the religious authorities who have made the law into a burden and placed it on the people's backs and made them carry it. And so Jesus sees and Jesus tries to help others realize that the law has ceased to be the law. Because the law is connected to God's story. It is connected to the Exodus. It is intended to set people free. It is intended to bring life, to bring salvation. It is not intended to bring bondage. And so Jesus heals on the Sabbath to show that Sabbath is made for the man and not man for the Sabbath. And Jesus overturns the tables in the temple to show that the the exchange of money for sacrifice and for objects of religious duty is an abomination to the temple. 
is not in keeping with the law of God because people are enslaved to the economy of the temple. Jesus demonstrates to the watching world that the law has become something it was never intended to be. And so then we can hear Paul's words in a new light. That Paul is not just dismissive of the law. Paul uses the language of the law throughout his writing, talking about at the very end of our passage that being heirs to Abraham, being sons and daughters of Abraham, sons and daughters of the covenant, the covenant that was founded upon the law. But Paul reminds us that we no longer need a disciplinarian because we have been set free to recognize who God is in Christ. We know who God is and how God works and how God intends for that law to shape us as individuals and as a community. When we understand the law with its connection to the Exodus, when it's, with its connection to the story of God setting God's people free, we see then that the law is not just a set of arbitrary principles. It's not just an ancient legal code that we have to follow or else. The law becomes a tool. It becomes a means to keep alive the story of the Exodus. It, it, a means to keep alive the story of God's liberating power. A means for the covenant people, the Israelites and us, to keep faith with the covenant. And it is a powerful undercurrent, always calling the church to be faithful, always challenging our assumptions and always challenging our temptation to make the law a burden rather than a delight. And so God, far from being the disciplinarian, continues to be the God of compassion and salvation, forever seeking to make us, to make God's own people a community of compassion and a community of salvation. Let us pray. God, we thank You that You have set us free. You have set us free from the many things that tie us down and entangle us. From the many forms of bondage that we still experience today, we thank You that You have liberated us. And may our life together as a community reflect the power that You showed in the Exodus, the power that You showed in shaping the people of Israel. We thank You that You have called us Your children, that You have made us Your people by Your grace. In Jesus' name we pray.